Now fortunately, a nuclear attack has not occurred on American soil. But what if it does? How will the federal government respond? Hurricane Katrina, which devastated parts of the Gulf Coast, proved that a large-scale disaster is difficult to respond to. And some even called Hurricane Katrina a dress rehearsal for a weapons of mass destruction attack. So how ready are we? Well, unlike a hurricane, a terrorist attack usually isn't predictable. The lessons of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina shows that it's just as important to prepare for a U.S. response as it is to try to prevent a WMD disaster from happening. Since 1997, the Army Reserve has taken an increased role in homeland defense. With nearly 400 certified hazardous materials experts and 2,400 chemical soldiers trained and ready, the Army Reserve has the largest hazmat team in the world. Because of all of these capabilities that the Army Reserve has in it to provide that kind of support during wartime, the capabilities are in particularly very applicable to assisting in here at home in case of a big disaster. And every year since 2003, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin hosts a training exercise called Red Dragon. Lieutenant Colonel Terry Farrell is a special projects officer for the U.S. Army Reserve Homeland Defense Division. When planning the exercise, Colonel Farrell and his team's goal was to keep it as realistic as possible. What we're trying to do here is to identify the things that, that, uh, that soldiers would face the considerations that commanders would have uh, so that if they are, are ever called to a real incident that they can be a positive impact and not just another uh, unit that's wandering around to see what, what they need to do. Full support from Fort McCoy is essential for the Red Dragon exercise to run smoothly. They did a fantastic job. Uh, they, they basically said we're going to do it both ways. We're going to throw all of our resources into the exercise. They brought every, uh, every fireman they had on. Uh, uh, their night shift, their, their next shift came in, all of their law enforcement personnel, they brought everybody in for security, and they conducted the exercise with real-world missions the same way that it would happen if it were a real event. Partnerships are established. Agencies that don't normally get to work together team up to deal with the crisis. It's a rare opportunity that uh, we get to play in this type of arena. Uh, the command experience that my staff is getting from by utilizing this joint a uh, venture between the military and the civilian sector is something that is paramount and has to continue progressing over the years uh, to prevent uh, the disasters that may occur in, in the United States. The one that's suspected. The suspected white pipe bomb. In the training exercise, the call comes in that a train hauling chlorine, brake fluid, and a pesticide parked at the rail yard on post may be leaking. Master Sergeant Bob Mihelic, the Hazardous Materials Coordinator, knows that if the chemicals mix, a deadly cloud will form, causing a second disaster. When he goes to deploy, you're going to recommend that they... He immediately sends a hazmat team to the rail yard to investigate. Hazmat teams inspect the rail cars with caution, wearing highly sophisticated protective gear. But unfortunately, the gear couldn't protect against the concussion of a blast. Fire and rescue crews rush in to evaluate the situation. They find victims at the scene and then pull them out. The ensuing fire sends the deadly gas cloud into the air. The train explosion creates a new problem. The Army Reserve chemical units who are at Fort McCoy to assist with the aftermath of the nuclear blast suddenly find their response the target of a coordinated attack. The command puts the nuclear response on hold until the incident on post is contained. And the Army Reserve units that, had lo that were located in the staging area for the Byronville operation were diverted to support the installation's response piece. As a gas cloud begins to spread throughout the post, police begin redirecting traffic and evacuating buildings. Preparing for casualties with chemical exposure, Army Reserve chemical units erect several decontamination tents on the edge of the gas cloud. But before the soldiers can finish their setup, a large crowd of wounded arrive, most in need of immediate medical care. The soldiers do the best they can in dealing with the situation. The goal is to save as many lives as possible everyone will eventually be decontaminated, whether they're alive or dead. Follow me. Go this way. 
Throughout the night, the wounded keep coming. By this time, decontamination tents are set up at various locations on post to treat wounded for chemical as well as radiation exposure from the nuclear blast. Your body is going to be red. You're green. It's a gruesome job that soldiers like Sergeant Louis Scapiccio must prepare to handle. We always say we train as we fight, and we know that if this ever did happen, it would be a pretty scary situation. Um, I don't know if there's anything you could do to mentally prepare to see um, the kind of thing that would come from this. Uh, the kind of devastation and the kind of human casualties that could come from it. Uh, we talk about it a lot. Everybody knows what they'll probably see. I don't know if there's any real preparation, but I'd say that they're as prepared as they can be, and they know what to expect if it ever does happen. It's the hottest time of the year at Fort McCoy, and the protective suits these soldiers wear are very uncomfortable at best. Uh, you gotta get used to being hot, used to being in these suits and being uh, constricted. Uh, definitely people who are claustrophobic aren't going to find this to be too enjoyable. Um, it takes a certain level of flexibility in a person to be able to change like we did with our setup in just one week. Um, to be able to adapt to, as we saw, taking our time for the setup and then having casualties right there and having to pick it up. Um, so flexibility and uh, a certain mental capacity to be able to deal with frustrating and long situations. But as Quran Ayers says, soldiers don't complain because they understand the importance of their job. These guys are so passionate about what they do. They love it, they, the, the morale is up, and that's what it's all about. You have to have the morale. Observers oversee the operation of the entire exercise. Their job is to make sure units are completing their tasks to Army standard. They're doing pretty good. Setting up within 10 minutes, operational within 30 minutes. We want to try to capture as much of the, uh, the issues, the, the things that went well, the things that went poorly, the AAR type comments as we possibly can. Incident commanders are also held to procedure and graded on how they respond. Every problem must be overcome in practice because in a real world situation, real lives are at stake. When the event actually occurs, we have to be able to operate in a civilian environment. And, and this is what this exercise brings out. We have the, the military forces that are actually learning how to talk the language of the civilians. We get to see how they operate because they do operate a little different than we do. The federal government will dedicate all of its resources in helping you and your family immediately following a nuclear, biological, or chemical attack. Red Dragon is such an exercise that brings together all the elements needed to respond to a natural disaster or a WMD attack. This is what we do. This is nothing new to us. It's just instead of doing it overseas, we're doing it here. We have actually put out in the annual training guidance from the commander that all chemical units are to train with local first responders, their fire departments, so that they know the equipment that they have to use and vice versa. And again, they learn that talking and they, they, they understand their language. In its third year, the Red Dragon exercise continues to rapidly grow, attracting international participation from the Canadian Army. Uh, so we're down here to, as observers, in, in essence, to see what you've got, the equipment, the organization, how you actually respond, the training you do, uh, and try to get something from it uh, for our benefit as well. 2006 also brings on board new equipment that Homeland Defense officials say is the most advanced reconnaissance and decontamination trailer setup ever built. Designed as an all-inclusive self-contained transportation setup, these trailers carry everything from a Gator ATV to Cascade Air refill stations, as well as tents, suits, and everything else a reserve chemical soldier would need to respond to a disaster on American soil. And that's what these trailers provide. The units that are out there in the field that actually have to do this mission, they, these are going to significantly enhance their ability to perform that function, to do the, to get on the ground and to get there when they're needed. The ease of loading and unloading is what impressed Staff Sergeant Malika Felder the most. We have to have like an eight-man team just to lift one box up. And I mean, I'm, I'm really, we got like ten boxes out of that whole set, and it's really putting a strain on the soldiers before we even get to do our mission. So this is going to be a lot easier. With over a thousand participants in Red Dragon 2006, Armory Reserve chemical units will be able to put these trailers to the test. There's an old saying that says you prepare for the worst and hope for the best. With the disaster response capabilities we've illustrated, the hope is the training from Red Dragon is never needed. However, the reality of today's world says that at some point it may be. But note that the Army Reserve's Homeland Defense Team, the most capable disaster response force in the world, will be ready whenever or wherever they're needed.